Brothers and sisters, I present to you with joy, the Right Reverend Bishop Allen, Bishop of Honduras, as he brings a special message, I'm sure, to us this <coughs> morning. Bishop Allen, thank you. Good morning to everyone. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here and with you all during in this time of uh, what we now call this new normal. There are several good things about this and there's others not too good as I usually uh, speak and share. Uh, the, good, the good thing is that no matter where you are, uh, you know, we can, we can connect, we can, we can get together. And if we have a feeling we can see each other is not, it doesn't matter how far or near we are. The not so good thing about this is I have a, I have a personal problem with it because I, I miss the, the being in touch with. And if you're, if you're a Latin American, you would know that uh, we Latin Americans, uh, we reach out and we, we touch people. Uh, we want to be in contact with. So, you know, this virtual proceeding that we're now involved with, uh, it's, sometimes it's a hindrance. It, it's good because you can stay in the comfort of your home and or, you know, wherever you want to connect. You could, you could be there and you are, but uh, at the same time, uh, and, and, and please understand, uh, for me, it is uh, very impersonal. It, it's becoming so impersonal uh, that, you know, as many of you may, may have, uh, you know, turn off the camera because uh, we didn't feel right to, to fix up this morning and, and for everybody to see me so I can just hide behind the camera. So, you know, these are the things that I, I don't like with. However, I can't do anything about that. The only thing I could do is pray about it and pray for you. So this morning we're here. <clears throat> uh, during this time of Advent, and I, I want to zero in on the prophet Isaiah. Uh, this morning, the, the, the theme that uh, Reverend Z uh, has, uh, has prepared for you all is, is water. But I'm, I'm very fearful. I don't want to talk about water, not because I don't like water. Maybe you would think, well, the bishop doesn't like water because he doesn't like taking showers. Yes, I do. <clears throat> but uh, we have been through so much. We have had more water than we wish to have. So water is, is good. But one of the things this morning that I want to share with you and bring before you and put before you is something that we really don't like to deal with. And which Advent and the gospel both today and last week is asking us to be prepared and to wait, to wait. Do you all know what the clients of, of doctors are called? They're called patients. Patients, because you get to the doctor and where do you have to sit? You have to sit in a waiting room. And, and nobody like to, Nobody likes to sit in that waiting room because we, we really don't like to wait. We like to get to where we are and let people come and, uh, and take care of us. So we, we, we really have a, a, a big problem with waiting. But the reality is we do have to wait. Some of us, uh, you know, want to be in, in anticipation. And if you all remember, I'm going to refer a lot to last uh, Sunday's readings because it is all part of this anticipation, of this waiting. And the disciples last Sunday came to Jesus and said, you know, 
they probably nudge Jesus on the side and say, you know, but tell us, please tell us, when will this thing be? When will it come to pass? And, and Jesus said, you know, uh, I don't know. It's not for me to know. And, and this Sunday we are here with, with the Sunday of John the Baptist, the, the speaker of the house who, who goes out to say, and, you know, uh, John was not the nicest person that you had to uh, be in contact with. John was very bold. John didn't hold back anything. And sometimes some of us are, are so conceited, we don't want to say the thing because we don't want to hurt anybody's feeling. John really didn't care about that. John really didn't care. If you felt bad because of what he said, so be it. So we are dealing today with, with John. And his, and his preaching of repentance, turn around. But in the midst of all this, we are, what this waiting? I don't want to wait. Some times ago, if you all recall, there was a pastor or a preacher in, in Waco, Texas. And he said to the people, you know, let us all come together. And he brought his congregation together. And he said, uh, you know, it's, the time is here. Let us come together because time is upon us and things are going to change. And uh, the Lord is coming tomorrow. And he gathered all his people and he torched the church. And the end of time came for them because he killed them all. They couldn't wait. If you remember Jim Jones back in Guyana in South America. Gather all his people and he said, you know, come together because we're going to have a party. Because tomorrow the end is here. And he gave them Kool-Aid and they all drank Kool-Aid. Kids and, and adults, men and women, boys and girls. And that day, time ended for them because he killed them all. Back in Africa, there was a former Roman Catholic priest who left the Roman Catholic Church and he formed his own congregation, about 7,000 people. And they would gather every Sunday. And uh, in 1999, he said, we're having a big celebration because at 12.01, of 2000, everything will end. And everybody was there. And he torched the church and killed 7,000 people. And the end is not here. And we're still waiting. Waiting creates in us a range of feelings and emotion. At the top of the list is impatience remember that patience is one of the gifts of the spirit you must wait patience impatience it is our everyday lives we encounter long lines that we want to go at the grocery store or these days here in honduras yesterday i was i decided to cook because I like, I like to cook, and uh, I was uh, trying to find some oxtail because I, I wanted to do a Jamaican-style oxtail, and, and I went to the store, but I was blown away. When I got to the store, there was probably a line uh, from uh, CHS to Blue Hill Ave. It was a long line. And I, I was driving my car, and there was a long line for the cars until you got into the supermarket. There's a huge supermarket in Honduras, in San Pedro Sula. Uh, it's called uh, Price Mart. It's, you know, one of these mega supermarkets. And then I got out of the car, parked the car, and when I tried to get in, the people say, no, you got to go to the back of the line. 
And I looked at the line. If I could have shown you the line, honestly, honestly speaking, it was from CHS to Blue Hill Ave. And I, and I said, my goodness, um, you know, I'm not going to have the time to go back home and, and pick this up, stay. But I said, what the heck? I got on the line. And, I, and I, it was a long waiting. I waited in that line for about two hours. Two hours in that line. And longer, you know, we get and we leave there or we leave our place and we get to the street and there and there's stop signs that say you have to stop and you have to wait. People around all around us in the back or in the front are impatient. We get impatient. How long must we wait in this line? Waiting also produces anticipation and yearning. We haven't seen, probably we haven't seen our loved ones for such a long time in months, perhaps years. We have made arrangement for a visit. They are arriving today. Let us tidy up the place. Now we just wait expectantly, hopefully, joyfully, looking to the door, waiting for their arrival. How long do we have to wait before they arrive? Waiting can generate in us anxiety. Anxiety. The doctor called and said, uh, on, we won't have the result for you until the lab's result come in. And we want to know if it's benign or it's, uh, uh, it's bad news. How long do we have to wait for this call? Waiting is a major part of the story of God's people throughout the Bible. We see God people waiting at the base of Mount Sinai for Moses to bring down the Torah. We see Jonah, and we heard of Jonah waiting in the belly of the fish. We see uh, Noah building the ark, and people would walk by and say, uh, you know, what are we doing? Jonah, uh, Noah said, well, I'm building the ark. What are you, why are you building the ark? It's going to rain here. It's never rain here, and the people... Jonah said, wait and you will see. And even after the disaster, we see the exile of the people of Judah waiting in the far off country of Babylon, yearning to go home. They can only wait and hope and pray that they can someday cross the desert between them and Jerusalem. In all these cases, the people of God are waiting for redemption waiting for salvation, waiting for an end to suffering. The reading for today from the prophet Isaiah addresses the theme <clears throat> of waiting. Isaiah's audience in particular are those Hebrew people waiting for their return from the exile on Babylon. For the Hebrews, this time in captivity is a mixture of anticipation and yearning combined, I'm sure, with anxiety and with patience. But they became impatient. But Isaiah provides them one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry in the Bible. It details not only how the Hebrews are going to get out of exile, but describes also the very nature of God. The poem opens with God saying to a heavenly council, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she had served her term and her penalty is paid. And how does the heavenly council respond? And a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That's what John was talking about. Make straight his path. Make straight his highway for our God. Just imagine how wonderful 
hearing this would be to those people waiting anxiously in captivity so far from home. Babylon is hundreds of miles from their home in Jerusalem, across a rocky and barren desert. But this obstacle will no longer burden God's chosen people. God is coming. God will lead these wayward people out of exile back to their homeland. Their anxious waiting is coming to an end. God will lead them despite any hardships. And the poem continues. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. He was thinking about this is a new exodus, something different. All people will see the glory of the Lord. All people will see it together. I, I, I love the scripture. I know so many who feel comforted by these words. Isaiah helps us to, in our own Advent waiting, it is one of the things that we need to do in Advent. We read it in the second Sunday of Advent. But what? We don't want to wait. We want to go on with our lives. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the things I, in, in growing up in the Episcopal Church in, in Taylor, we were taught uh, to wait for Christmas. And we couldn't, uh, you know, we couldn't wear our, our, our goodies that we were getting for Christmas. We had to wait because it was Advent. And Miss, uh, I remember my people like uh, Veronica and Fermina and, and uh, I don't know, maybe you all remember Randy and, and people growing up and telling us, you know, you have to wait. And, you know, you can't tell a kid to wait. And, and we, we, we had to wait, man. Uh, and, but we just didn't want to do that. I had to wait in that long line yesterday. You have to wait. And some of us even are, are now celebrating Christmas even before it gets here. You know, uh, you, you, you light up a, and people prepare and, and look around their homes and they're going to pick out a Christmas tree and, and you turn a television and they say, you know, Christmas is here. The material world is telling us that we have to celebrate Christmas before Christmas is, is there. You can't wait. You got to go and take out that tree and we got to prepare and, and get that tree ready. Not the Jesse tree. You go and, you, and, and they take out all these things and they begin to prepare the tree and they light the tree and everything and all the stuff were placed under the tree and sometimes they've even opening the gifts before Christmas. Why? Because we can't wait. Isaiah evokes the warmth and the comfort of the Advent season. Perhaps even hear the beautiful strain from Handel Messiah with the poem, Comfort, comfort ye my people. And this is not, is God saying, comfort, comfort ye my people. And this is what we do, right? This is how we approach our difficulties of waiting in Advent. We do things with it. We busy ourselves. We shop for presents. We prepare our wreaths on the doors and on the windows or wherever. We decorate our homes. We throw parties. We go to parties. We will be our December calendars is uh, filled up. You know, you don't want to uh, do anything else with December because December is filled up, getting ready. And then there is not a thing wrong with any of that. Part of the comfort in, in my Advent waiting this past, as I said to you, is I've had people around here Trying to get me involved in a 
in an Episcopal party. Have you, have you ever heard anything like that? An Episcopal party where men will get together and enjoy the holiday theme. Then at home, we started to put out a Christmas tree. We are, had some artificial Christmas tree for 23 years. They are old and, and you just can't get rid of it because it's there. Comfort, comfort ye my people. All these types of activities are good and important part of waiting in Advent. By participating in these rituals, we are being comfort, oh comforted. Uh, people are part of the reason these rituals brings us comfort. We know the good news. We know how this story ends. We know that Christ comes. We know that God is with us. At the same time, we must also consider what John the Baptist reminds us of today's gospel. The Advent season, we're not looking forward to the birth of Jesus Christ. We are seeking Jesus, who was God incarnate in the River Jordan. Through our baptism, we are called to be part of that incarnation of the body of Christ, and we have a role to play. So in the midst of our Advent, waiting these scriptures, we are ready today to comfort us, but they also addresses a comfort that is bigger in, with capital letters, bigger than our desire to feel good around Christmas time. In other words, it is not just about you and about me. It is not just about us. We need to put ourselves in the place of the prophet who asked God, what shall I cry? We know that the story of the good news, we know about God's love for us and for all in God's creation. We have heard it proclaimed again and again. So here is what the role we are supposed to play. We are called to be the ones who proclaim the comfort to others who are suffering. And brothers and sisters in Christ, these past 20 days, I have seen suffering in this, in this my country. Honduras, in 2020, I can't wait for 2020 to leave. 2020 has been so tragic. We were confined in Honduras. We were confined to our homes. We could not leave since March 12th. We could not go out. In Honduras, you could go out on the street two times in the month. And it depended on the ending number of your ID. Twice a month, we were closed in. And, and personally, it has been tragic. In April, I, I lost my eldest brother. And the thing about it is I could not go, not even in Honduras, I could not travel. He lived on the Bay Island and I couldn't go. And beyond that, I saw a number of congregants, members of these congregations passed away because nobody believed really really believed in, in COVID. Nobody would wear a face mask because they didn't believe it. And a lot of people passed away. And COVID went on. And almost 15 days ago, my older sister passed away and I couldn't go. It couldn't be there. I was present virtually 
but I couldn't be there. <clears throat> Almost the same time we, we experience a hurricane. Uh, do you know what it is to experience, to have a twin hurricane, a repeat hurricane? Hurricanes came to Honduras. And after that one first hurricane, there was a second hurricane. We had two hurricanes in less than 15 days. Hurricanes with the, uh, what they call it, the term it a, a five category hurricane that ravaged this country, one after the other, like uh, ETA was not enough. We got a second one that came through the same path and hurt and hurted the same people. We got the equivalent of one year of rain in two different days. One year of rain in two different days. The airport in Honduras, in San Pedro Sula, the water got up to the second level at the airport. We have over 75,000 people living in shelters as I speak to you today. Friday, Friday evening, we have a gathering uh, center here at the Cathedral Church. We're gathering food and, and clothing and medication and, and, and pampers and, and, and everything that people need. But Friday, I got myself together. I went over to the uh, gathering centers and there were four families. And I want you to try to picture uh, water coming into your house nonstop, and you have to run out just with what you have on your back and, and find a way to wobble through mud, muck, grime, and water gushing from everywhere. And you just have to find somewhere to stay. Four families got out. And four families with a number of others knocked on the door of this church and says, uh, can you help us? And they said to me, I, we have nothing. The husband came to this place with a friend, with a member of this uh, church. And he said, uh, you know, I, I have never begged in my life. But I need to, I need you all to help me. He said, I have a wife who just got out of the hospital because she had surgery to remove a tumor from her breast. For 15 days, for 20 days, he said, we have been sleeping on pallets. You know what a pallet is? Whenever you uh, load a container, everything that is placed on, on pallets. He said, we have been sleeping on pallets. And I went to their homes and I loaded our cars with food, with mattresses and everything that we could put together. And we took it there. And when these ladies saw us coming in with the things, they started to cry. Because they said, uh, the government hasn't been here to help us. The mayor hasn't been here to, to ask us about anything, but you know, it's, it's overwhelming. And uh, we, we unloaded the cars and, and, and we took everything, we took, uh, perishable and non-perishable food. And I asked them, do you have a refrigerator? 
<laughs> the guy looked at me and, and he laughed and he said, uh, he said, Bishop, uh, it, can I call you Bishop? He said, yes. I said, doesn't matter. It, he said, you, you're asking me if I have a refrigerator. Uh, he said, I said, yes, because we're bringing some uh, frozen chickens and some stuff. He said, we're going to put them out in the sun that they could defrost because we got to uh, try to fix them and, and get rid of them and eat them because we don't have where to save, Bishop. And I said, my gosh. Four families, and every family had four or five or six kids. And those kids were sleeping on pallets in a cramped neighborhood. And the joy they felt when we unloaded mattresses and they said, we had all these things, but we don't have anything. And he said, thanks for coming to us. And I wanna to say to you today, sometimes, sometimes we, we take things for granted. We took so much for granted. Even here, I talk to my kids and I say, uh, you know, you are blessed. And you don't know how blessed you are. But God has been good to us. And God comes and comfort. And one of the things I've, I've learned in walking around, uh, you know, uh, shelters, and, and taking food and taking clothing uh, and looking around San Pedro Sula is those who are called the vulnerable people are always those who suffer more. One of the things I've learned is that God, God is not an Episcopalian. God is the God for us. If you're Methodist, if you're Roman Catholic, if you're Presbyterian, and God is there for us. It's a God of mercy. It's a God that is bigger than our desire to just feel good around this time in, other, in Christmas. In other words, it is not just about us. As I said at the outset, <clears throat> I wrestled yesterday evening after speaking to Reverend Z. And she said, you know, the water is the theme. But, but then she, she sort of comforted me and said, but Bishop, you could do whatever you want with scriptures. And I said, praise the Lord. Because I have had water everywhere driven through water walked through water drenched with water more than we have ever expected we are called to share the good news we need to put ourselves in the place of uh, Isaiah the prophet who asked God what shall I cry you know the story of the good news. We know about God's love for us and for all in God's creation. And, and one of the things that, that I have come to grip with is that we go, we're going to continue to have hurricanes in Honduras. And people didn't like me to say these things. We're going to continue to have hurricanes in Honduras. Uh, and we're going to continue to be flooded out year after year because in Honduras, uh, the deforestation of our mountains. Climate change is a reality in Honduras. It floods where it never flooded before. And this is not only true in Honduras. <clears throat> it is true. It's going to be true with you all in, in Boston and the East Coast. It's going to snow like it's never snowed before. You know, in Antarctica, Antarctica, which is the the southern pole, you know what? It snowed, and it it's cold there year round. 
But all of a sudden they got up one morning and the snow was green. The ice was green. You ever heard about green ice? It became a reality in Antarctica. In the southern part of Honduras, the people didn't know what to do. One morning they got up and on the border with, with El Salvador and it was snowing for crying out loud, snowing in Honduras. Can you believe that? Climate change is doing and will continue to do because we have been really bad stewards of the gift that God has placed in our hand. We are called to be the ones who proclaim and we are called to be comforters of each other's. To proclaim and comfort others who are suffering. And there's a lot of people suffering in, in different parts of the world. You know, now there, there's a locus of, of uh, grasshoppers shredding places in Africa today. If you're in Florida, now you have to deal with the pythons, not only with gators. Because human beings have turned God's world around. And we want to change it. Waiting because we, we, can't, we can't just wait. Waiting can be so difficult. And as I, was, as I said, the, in Central America, the people cut and they cut down everything. I haven't been able to travel because I'm fearful that I would be driving down a road and the hill next to that road will begin to collapse. It's happening in Honduras. Hills are collapsing. It rains so much that the hills are sobbed with water. And all of a sudden, the hill just give away. At the end of Hurricane Ayota, there was a town called La, La Reina in northwestern Honduras, a department which you all call a state. Uh, it's called Santa Barbara. In the middle of Santa Barbara, La Reina, people were sleeping and they heard the the, the hills began to roll and crumble. Praise the Lord that those people was able to get up and get out of their homes. 500 people, 500 homes were buried because the hill just gave away and people were running north, west, south, and east, getting out of the way. Today, those people doesn't have a home. The homes were buried. The homes are buried. It's, it's, I probably think that you cannot conceive 500 homes buried in, in less than an hour. In another part of Santa Barbara, the only two persons that was rescued out of that collapsing of that hill was a, an eight-year-old boy and his baby sister of seven or eight months. How they got out, only God knows. And this is all because we can't wait. Wait becomes so difficult. Knowing that God is with us, I speed up the lines and try to get through that line yesterday. That line was an ease of congestion in so much people. And I said, if, if I don't get through this line, and I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get to, to where all the ingredients I needed for that ox tail. And we can't wait. It won't make our loved ones arrive at your doors any faster. Believing God is present won't make the doctor call with lab results any sooner. But knowing God is with us in the midst of this waiting can ease the impatience, guide the anticipation, and comfort the anxiety in these situations. It won't ease the waiting on those four families 
It won't ease the waiting on those people living under a bridge today because they have no more homes. It won't ease the impatience, the guide and the anticipation and comfort, the anxiety of those in waiting. And as God's faithful people, like the prophet, must find our own voices to speak words of comfort and healing and hope to anyone who feel separated or abandoned by God. God will come. God will enter the experience of all who wait. God will bring them peace and God will bring us peace. As I said at the outset, this has been a tragic time with all what happened. And Friday evening did not end too well for me. Because I have a good friend. I had a good friend. He was also a bishop, bishop of Ecuador. Originally was from Panama. And Friday evening, I, I got a call. And another bishop friend said to me, uh, Victor, the bishop of Ecuador, just, just died. And I said to myself, what else, Lord? But in these words of this, of today's gospel and the reading from uh, Isaiah and listening to John the Baptist and you know what? God, God is our God. And God never gives us more than we can bear. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, please, please wait. Wait in the Lord. God is God. God will enter the experience of all who wait. God will bring peace. I know he will bring peace to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I know God will provide for us. I know God will open the doors. Even when we cannot wait, God will bring us peace. People of CHS, we must learn to wait. And God will come in due time. I don't know when, you don't know when, but that is not for us to determine. Let us do what God has called us to do. Let us be patient. Let us not grow anxious because above all, God loves us and God loves us as we are. Amen.